welcome to the IFPDA Foundation Book Award Conversation with Christina Lyle, author of 2020 Book Award winner, The Women of Atelier 17, Modernist Printmaking in Mid-Century New York. I'm Jenny Gibbs, Executive Director of the IFPDA and the IFPDA Foundation. <clears throat> Today's discussion with author Christina Weil will be led by Jennifer Farrell, Associate Curator, Department of Drawings and Prints at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Jennifer will also be leading a conversation tomorrow, Wednesday, October 28th at noon with collectors Jordan Schnitzer, Leslie Garfield, and Joanna Garfield for the last in the series of symposia, Collecting Impressions, Six Centuries of Print Connoisseurship, which was co-organized by the Center for the History of Collecting and the Metropolitan Museum of Arts Department of Drawings and Prints with support from the IPDA Foundation. We hope you can join us for that as well. After Christina's presentation today, Jennifer will lead the conversation with some questions and we will then open up the conversation to include your questions as well. If you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand off the Zoom baton to IFPDA Foundation President, Robert Newman, who will be introducing our presenters. Hello, I am Robert Newman, President of the IFPDA Foundation. The foundation was founded in 2009 to inspire and support educational projects aimed at fostering connoisseurship in the field of fine prints and collecting. And I am pleased to say that this book by Christina Weil is one of the finest we have seen supporting and promoting uh, women print net makers mid-century with modernism coming out of Atelier 17. Christina Weil received her BA from Georgetown University in 2005 and completed her master's and doctorate in art history at Rutgers University in 2012 and 2015. Besides today's present topic, her book about women printmakers who are members of Atelier 17, her re research in interests also include mid-century color printmaking, WPA graphic arts, workshops, American Living Abroad, Interwar Paris, and pro-feminist activity in the 1940s and 1950s. Her research has been supported by the Metropolitan Museum, Getty Foundation, Mellon Foundation. She has published in art in print, print quarterly, archives of American art journal, and contributed to several anthologies and exhibition catalogs from 2014 to 2018. She served as co-president for the Association of Print Scholars, a nonprofit professional organization she co-founded in 2014. Prior to her graduate studies, she worked for IFPDA member Gemini GEL at Joni Weil, uh, which represents in publications of Los Angeles-based artist workshops at Gemini. She will be in conversation later with Jennifer Fowle, who is an associate curator for the Department of Prints and Drawings at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where she is responsible for modern and contemporary prints, illustrated books, and artist books. Previously, she held curatorial positions at the Yale University Art Gallery, University of Virginia, and the Whitney Museum of American Art Independent Study Program. She is a BA, she has a BA from uh, Smith College and a PhD from the Graduate Center of the City of University of New York. Please enjoy the presentation. Okay, um, so uh, thank you very much, Robert and Jenny, for those introductions. Um, let's see, now I need to share my screen. All right. Um, thank you so much, everybody. I think the way that we're going to do this is I'm going to talk for a little bit, and then Jennifer and I will uh, be in conversation. Um, so first of all, I want to say it's such an honor to receive this and to have received it um, co-awarded with a team of researchers at the Metropolitan Museum who spoke last week about the Renaissance of etching. Um, and also wanted to start off by just saying thank you to the IFPDA for um, its, its committee who read for the book award for reading the book um, and acknowledge the support of a few institutions who helped make this book possible, um, grants from the Wyeth Foundation for American Art, the Society for the Preservation of American Modernism. Um, and then during my, um, this book was a dissertation, so it was supported heavily by um, many people at Rutgers University um, and also a major grant, I mean, a, a fellowship from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. 
Um, so what I want to do is briefly just set up a little bit about what Atelier 17 was before we dive into who its um, female members are and what the book is really about. So Atelier 17 was um, a modernist avant-garde printmaking workshop that was founded in Paris in the late 1920s by a gentleman, a British artist named Stanley William Hayter, who you can see here um, on the left. And he was this very charismatic, very energetic um, person who had this infectious love of printmaking. And in particular, his specialty was engraving. Um, uh, he had a background in, he was trained in chemistry, uh, at the, um, in, I think, University College of London, um, and then ended up in his 20s uh, going and working in oil fields in what is now Iran. After contracting malaria, he comes back to England. He, become, he decides he's going to become an artist, and he uh, moves to Paris uh, in uh, 1920s. Uh, and then through a couple of connections with other English-speaking expats who were living in this sort of heated, uh, milieu of, of interwar Paris, he begins to be interested in printmaking. So first he works with uh, an American um, uh, artist named uh, Mary Huntoon, who is from Kansas and was actually a friend, a classmate, former classmate of his then girlfriend uh, at the Art Students League who had studied with Joseph Pennell. Um, she introduces him to some basics of etching and aquatint uh, and then through word of mouth, he ends up interning or sort of having a, um, a period of study with a Polish based artist who was also in Paris um, named Joseph Hecht. And then from there, it's sort of history. The studio um, is set up initially in his, his own home studio in Paris that had a number of different addresses uh, as it moved in the 30s. Um, Atelier 17 really gets its name from its last location in Paris, which was 17 Rue Campagne Premier. Uh, and the group was comprised of probably about 50 or 60 artists in Paris, um, many of whom are well-known surrealists. Um, but really it didn't matter so much what your aesthetic persuasion was. If you wanted, the whole point of Atelier 17 was to experiment, to learn more about the graphic arts, to learn more about where the graphic arts might take you in this very surrealistic way, you know, like what are the possibilities of um, making a print? And so you'll see a lot of a lot of uh, artists go off and take this experience into different media. Um, so you'll have a lot of sculptors who see um, the experience of making a print as formative to their later experimentation with um, with uh, sculpture. Or we'll talk about a couple of other cases where um, collage was kind of the net uh, result of having made prints at Atelier 17. Um, in any event, um, Atelier 17 had to close down in 1939 with the Nazis' invasion of, of Paris. And many people scattered, but Hayter eventually settles in New York. And the picture that you see here on the right is the studio as it was in, uh, in its second location in New York. Initially, uh, Hayter latched on to the New School for Social Research, which was a fairly new um, educational uh, institution at the time. It was founded right after World War I by a group of dissident um, academics from Columbia University who wanted to create a new form of higher education where hierarchies were flattened uh, and professors and students were more equal and more collaborative together. And this was really in an effort to um, broaden and expand research into the social sciences um, sort of in the wake of the destruction of World War I. Um, in any event, the studio was there for five years in the building that was on West 12th Street. And then after those five years, it moved a little bit further down to East 8th Street um, into this loft space that you're seeing here on the right. It wasn't a very big space. It had two tables um, where one could come and work and then a press 
uh, two presses eventually in the back. Um, people were initially um, artists were asked to kind of come for, for an introductory uh, class, a lesson um, where you would learn some of the basics. Um, as Hayter developed his pedagogy a little bit more, it became um, more standardized. You would get a small plate that was about six by eight inches. Um, and you would work on this plate using multiple techniques, using engraving, etching, aquatint, soft ground etching, and you would really sort of just end up destroying it in a way, kind of taking it beyond what it was initially. And this experimental plate exercise um, was an introduction. And then you were meant to go on and do your own experimental uh, research. You know, you were meant to be a collaborator with others in the studio to have these conversations across the table. What are you working on? Well, I'm working on this. Oh, that's so interesting. And to incorporate some of those things into your own work. Um, so very much uh, after that first initial um, lesson, you were, uh, the studio was open. You know, I think you had to reserve time in the press, but beyond that, uh, the studio was kind of open and there were keys that circulated uh, and you could kind of come in when you wanted. Um, so as I approached this topic, I started from a list of about 50 artists, 50 women, um, who were included in Joanne Moser's important 50th anniversary exhibition catalog. And for that, Joanne really did a lot of legwork. Um, she looked in Hayter's Rolodex. She looked in um, his collection. She looked in um, exhibition catalogs for the group shows that Atelier 17 had together. Um, and put together a really solid foundation about what the studio was about and what the kinds of experimentation were. And so the studio was here in New York. Um, I'm in New York, sorry, I take that for granted. It was in New York from uh, 1940 to 1955. And after that, uh, Hayter moved back to Paris and that's where the studio remained until uh, 1988, 87. I'm sorry, I don't have the date in my my head, 80, 87, 88, when he dies. Um, in any event, uh, I, so I started from this list of about 50 or so women artists. And I started to see, as I was doing my research, these amazing images of women actually doing so much of the printmaking activity, whether it was um, engraving a plate, printing on the press, inking their own work. And it really got me curious to know a little bit more about these women who are not part of um, the standard narratives of the studio. Um, so much of the study of Atelier 17 is dominated by, by Hayter because he was such a charismatic person, personality. I mean, he was so gifted um, in making engravings. And then uh, many of the surrealist uh, men who were based in Paris in the 20s and 30s will, will garner a lot more attention. And then once the studio is here, um, a lot of times you'll hear mention that Jackson Pollock made his first prints there or that, or made some of his early prints there or that um, Mark Rothko and Robert Motherwell all made prints there, but there were just so many more women. And eventually I was able to amass a, a list of women that was almost a hundred. So what I'm showing you here is an appendix that's in the back of the book um, and uh, you probably won't be able to see exactly, uh, but there is a, a key to how um, they got added. The, the main point is that Atelier 17 was not um, super well documented institutionally. Hayter did not keep great records of who was there at any given time. And so it's a little bit of a, a process to reconstruct who was there. But I was really pleased that by the end of my research, I was able to sort of almost double the list of women who were, um, who we, we can definitely say were affiliated with the studio. Um, and before I go on to talk about the book a little, I wanted to mention um, this affiliated project, which I put together after the book was done, which is a, a supplement of biographical information about women who were part of the studio but who didn't necessarily get featured in the book. I was only able 
to uh, include or really focus on eight women with a few others who kind of come in and out sporadically. But I felt it was important to document what everybody's connection was to the studio, particularly because some of these women appear literally in these photographs of the studio um, and the evidence of their prints is so compelling that I felt I just needed to know more. So if you go to this website uh, after the talk today, I think you'll get a chance to read a lot of really fascinating information about Atelier 17 participants. Um, and for some, all I know is just that they might have been there in the 1950s. Um, and so hopefully this website will plant the seeds for later, um, later scholars to come and, and look at Atelier 17. And that's really one of the most important takeaways, I think, of my research is that Atelier 17 is an enormous enormous topic. Um, it was open for 60 years. There are over a thousand artists who studied there. Um, this is my take. This is my um, sort of dip into its history, but um, there are so many other narratives that I think we can pull out. Um, not just the legacy of the studio for women or its technical achievements or its role in surrealism. There's, there's a lot more there. So it's something I think other young scholars or um, museums should, should really endeavor to look at. Um, so I, I briefly wanted to just explain a little bit how I got into this topic. I, I began with Louise Nevelson, a sort of focused uh, independent study on this. Um, I discovered these wonderfully unique prints. Um, some of them are at the, the Brooklyn Museum. There's a huge group of Nevelson's prints at the Brooklyn Museum. Um, and then some at the Zimmerly Art Museum. Um, these prints, as you can see, are, are all um, are unique inkings from the same plate. Uh, the first one that you see on the left is what she called the first proof. Um, you can clearly see this figure, this goddess figure. And then she experimented with how to ink it in one. She inked it full of black ink and then pulled a dry paintbrush over it. Um, to reveal the figure underneath on the one that's in the sort of center right. She had it mostly blank and then um, painted it with a black paintbrush, but again, so much ink that it dripped down the bottom. And then on the far right, she sort of swirled it all the way around. Um, but I got really interested in, in how printmaking, what, how this experience of working at Atelier 17 for Nevelson which was, came in the late 40s and then again in 19, 1952 to 54, how it impacted some of the sculpture that she was making at the same time. And I couldn't help but think of some of the terracotta pieces um, that she made in the 40s, which are, are sort of etched in the same way that a plate would be etched. Um, and the same figures that are all um, really rooted in her exploration of pre-Columbian iconography after a couple of visits to Mexico and Guatemala. Um, and what I discovered in doing a real deep dive into to Nevelson was these prints were foundational to the sculpture that she has become so well known for. Um, they were hung on the walls of her first solo show at the Grand Central Moderns Gallery in 1955. Um, the center of the gallery had this piece that's no longer extant called the Bride of the Black Moon. And then in each of the four corners of the gallery were some of these, again, early black painted piece sculptures that are made of assemblages, assembled wood, um, of found objects that she nailed together and then painted black um, that represented the four corners of the globe. Um, and then on the walls were hung, hanging these Atelier 17 prints that she had made um, a few years previously. Um, and on the, the um, Bride of the Black Moon, this piece in the middle that you're seeing, she had a poem um, called A Fairy Tale in which she talks about the prints on the wall as being images um, that the bride, who was vaguely um, rep representative of Nevelson herself, had seen on her voyages. 
um, and those reference these trips to Guatemala and to Mexico. Um, and so really these prints are integral to this, this shift. And a lot of the uh, reviewers who saw the show talked about how um, Nevelson, how these were these on the walls. So that really got me hooked. And then I um, started to think about the connections, the overlay of gender norms in the 40s and the 50s on these women artists who were working at Atelier 17. Um, and so one of the chapters goes into specifically what some of these gender norms were um, and looking at things like um, what was the propaganda during the war surrounding women's labor and sort of uh, physical um, standards for how women should comport themselves when working in um, uh, factories as Ro you know Rosie the Riveters or Winnie the Welder um, and how that impacted women's work at Atelier 17. And I think you can see here in this cover of Charm Magazine, um, women were expected or thought it was thought better for women to have finely manicured hands or if they were doing hard work um, to wear gloves. And that's certainly not the case here in the image of, of, um, of Fanny Hillsmith and, and Harriet Berger Nerksy working um, at Atelier 17. Um, Harriet Berger Nerksy's hands are covered in ink. Um, people would talk about Nevelson as she came out of the studio as just laden with ink in her hands and all over her clothes and that this was somehow not, um, not following the standards of, of sort of the ideals of femininity in the 40s. Um, so that's something that I was fascinated with. I was also, as I alluded to before, really interested in this connection between sculptors and, uh, and printmaking. Um, and you see, as I tried to explain, Nevelson's evolution towards um, making these black painted sculptures is some, somehow rooted in the overly inked plates that she made at Atelier 17. Another very famous alumni of Atelier 17 is Louise Bourgeois. And I think you can clearly see here the relationship between her personage sculptures, which she began showing in the 50s and um, this very famous and important portfolio that she made at Atelier 17 called He Disappeared Into Complete Silence. Um, another sculptor who gets mentioned less often but who is um, fantastic in her own right is Dorothy Daner, who was for almost 25 years married to David Smith. Um, for various reasons, she did not make sculpture during their marriage and then the experience of working at Atelier 17 right after her divorce from Smith ignited a lot of interest. Um, another element of Atelier 17 that I picked up in my book is um, the gender, how gender norms infiltrated, um, infiltrated the technique and how it was discussed. Because by and large, what I found is that um, artists across um, you know, nationality, gender, um, religion, class, um, they all were working with the same tools and techniques. And yet the way that critics and the art world in New York perceived artists efforts in these, um, in their prints was very, very biased, very um, based in uh, assumptions about artists and their personal backgrounds. So one chapter focuses on this specifically. So here um, is, is a comparison I use to begin um, one chapter where I talk about Anne Ryan's abstraction and Stanley William Hayter's, one of his most famous prints called Combat and the way that reviewers talked about their use of soft ground etching. Um, soft ground etching, for those who don't know, I, I did put together a quick um, little slide. Um, engraving you can see here on the left is done with a very, very sharp tool. It's based in practices of um, armor uh, decoration from the 1400s and then it was adopted for, for replicating images. Um, hard ground etching is um, done mostly with a ground that is hard and you have to scratch off with a sharp tool. But soft ground etching, which was um, 
sort of invented in the 1700s, the ground that goes on is soft. And so if you look in these prints, um, in the left hand corner, left hand side of combat, you see this tissue paper that's created a texture. And then in, in Anne Ryan's abstraction, it's that gray um, shadowy area. In any event, um, when these prints were shown within the same month at different galleries and critics reviewed haters as being this um, wonderful example of a man really understanding and um, compellingly having control over every aspect of his um, of the textures that he was putting on the plate while Neville, while um, Ryan was reviewed positively but you know her etchings were seen as sent were described as um, delicate and essentially feminine so again you see the same techniques being um, reviewed very differently um, and then uh, Sue Fuller is sort of a champion of soft ground etching and really opens up many possibilities through her work at Atelier 17. And here I'm showing you the, some, one of her most famous works called Hen, in which she took a, lace, a Victorian lace collar that she had inherited from her mother um, and she cut it up into various pieces and then put it on a plate and filled in with some engraved lines to make the body of a, of a hen. Um, and, and Sue Fuller, um, it, if you get a chance, do read more about her because she's fascinating. She really wanted to ignore any kind of established hierarchies about this kind of fiber and women's work and lace and really give it its due as a material regardless of its association with um, with sort of a feminine background. Um, and so as I continued to do more research on, um, on Fuller, I began to see her, um, her real importance to later feminist activity regarding uh, lace and um, sort of its reformulation as, you know, not stereotypical, that it was, it shouldn't necessarily be considered um, a craft. Um, and I think that's another important thing to remember is that printmaking is often seen as a, a craft um, and that women were often left in this um, realm of craft, craftswomen, craftspeople, whereas men were somehow able to transcend that um, at their, in their work at Atelier 17 because of these gender norms. So uh, Miriam Shapiro, who was also at Atelier 17 in the 50s, um, later went on and made this amazing series called Anonymous Was a Woman. And I think you can see the debt that she had to somebody like Sue Fuller. Um, also, I began to think um, after Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away um, a few weeks ago, um, how this lace collar um, began uh, with Sue Fuller as, you know, sort of a, a reassertion of um, materials and then in, in Miriam Shapiro, a much more stridently political message and how Ruth Bader Ginsburg by putting on this lace collar for um, her appearances in the court was very much a sort of um, evolution of lace and being reappropriated by feminists um, as something that was something to be celebrated. Um, Sue Fuller goes on to make these wonderful abstractions that are um, so tied to her work at Atelier 17, where she wrapped string around um, these metal frames um, and created these abstract um, optical uh, pieces, which are amazing. And there are hundreds of these. Other women used uh, soft ground etching and fabric in their own ways to express other you know, personal trials and tribulations they might have had. And we can go back and talk a little bit more about Minna Citron and Squid Under Pier, which is the cover of the book. Um, but suffice to say that she um, really used these techniques to express some issues that were going on in her life. Um, Alice Trummel Mason, who's a founding member of the uh, Associated Abstract Artists, American Abstract Artists, uh, she used these lace and, and sort of um, fabric techniques uh, in soft ground etching to a totally different effect. It, for her, it was about spatial um, 
variation, about confounding your view of shapes and wondering where the planes were. Um, and she talked a lot about how she would have loved to have gotten more lost in the fabrics that she put into her Atelier 17 prints, but that something held her back um, from completely giving over to the textures. And I think that that has something to do with gender. Um, I wanna make sure that I'm, I'm recognizing our time. So I'm gonna go quickly here. Warden Day is another one of the artists who gets a lot of mention in the book. She's a wonderful um, printmaker, a wonderful sculptor. Um, she spent a lot of time out in the West and this becomes form form formative to the, the work that she does in sculpture later on. Um, but she always, like many women at Atelier 17, struggled with these um, really biased critiques of her work. And um, I wanted to just pair these two things together. Um, not many of these women got reviews from artists as, uh, um, critics as illustrious as Clement Greenberg, um, but, but Day's, one of her shows at Bertha Schaefer Gallery was reviewed. And I think my favorite um, part of this review is, um, that he says in the end, in spite of the mystical pretensions announced by the titles of Miss Day's pictures or her own catalog note, her art does not as yet go beyond felicity and it does not say enough yet to be important. I mean, ouch. Um, and then Warden Day was this really plucky woman who um, wanted to be involved and really saw in the late 50s, the need for solidarity among women artists and even in the 50s wanted to organize a show of her female colleagues. So when Linda Nochlin writes her now, I mean, so important essay, Why Have There Been No Great Women Artists? It's no surprise that Warden Day writes a letter to the editor um, discussing how important she thinks this piece was and note for the record, add one more out of town women artist working in the wilds of New Jersey, 35 minutes away from New York City. Um, we'll come back to Margaret Salento in a moment. Um, and then finally, um, just to touch on one more big theme in the book, um, the book talk, talks about how women, how many of these um, color woodcuts that she began making in the late 40s. Um, but Anne Ryan also just took opportunities, um, any opportunity she could to show her prints. Uh, and this photo that you see on the left is of Milgram's department store on 57th Street, um, which had a new ready to wear um, department that was on um, the second or third floor. And it was almost like one could go up and buy, it's very much in the, the model of um, the Associated American Artists that department stores were a perfect place for people to also buy art for their walls. And there really was a booming economy in the early 50s for um, people to decorate and to put art in their homes. And here you see a cross section of some of the works that Ryan was making. Some of them were abstract, some of them were figural. It was sort of like ready to wear. You could buy kind of what you wanted. Um, and finally, uh, the book ends on a note of how women formed proto-feminist networks together through their time at Atelier 17. Um, and on the left, you see one of these salons that um, Warden Day organized in the late 60s uh, with Dorothy Zayner sitting there. Um, and uh, a friendship between Jan Gelb and Mina Citron. And together they wrote a, a proto-feminist manuscript that never got published about um, Venus, the representation of women uh, from uh, prehistory from um, its earliest iterate women's or art's earliest foundations in you know cave paintings through modern art uh, and then in the lower right is M Miriam Shapiro uh, at uh, Mauricio Lazansky's studio at the University of Iowa um, and what I found so fascinating was as women aged and became involved in the feminist um, movement many of them went back to relationships that they had started in print studios in the in the 50s in the 40s um, and Miriam Shapiro met artists like Ellen Lanyon at the University of Iowa and together um, you know they would go on to form important feminist organizations that began this consciousness raising of women's um, unequal treatment in the art world. <laughs>
So I think that's where I wanted to end. And then uh, Jennifer, if you want to pop on, we can go back to any images you want to talk about. Good. Okay. Thank you, Christina. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation. And uh, it was really wonderful and richly illustrated. I think I should say in a full disclosure, I reviewed Christina's book earlier for the Gotham Center. And I thought I would like the book based on our conversations, but I had no idea that I would love it as much as I did. They gave me an extended essay and they still had to cut several thousand words because I was that enthusiastic. So if anyone is looking for a great read, you're too modest to do it. You need to be like all the uh, presenters on the news with your books lining the bookshelves behind you. Um, but it's available at Bookshop and it really is fantastic. Um, and there is certainly, as I said in the review, there is certainly no dearth of scholarship on mid-century American art, especially work made in New York. Yet you prove in this informative and important book, there are still many areas that warrant further study. Um, you conduct a close examination of American women printmakers from this period. And this subject, as I think you addressed, really qualifies as doubly ignored in uh, larger art history and cultural studies. So I wanna read a short passage that Christina wrote that I think really outlines what she does in the book and just how important it is for all of our colleagues, even outside of the print world. Um, she, you frame your ambition of the work as twofold, quote, toward the goal of expanding understandings of women's exploration of avant-garde printmaking at Atelier 17's New York workshop. This book has two main arcs. First, it unpacks the complexity of mid-century gender norms and develops their influence on printmaking. The second arc seeks to unravel the complex artistic hierarchies at mid-century and their impact on the commercial viability and critical visibility of women's artists, revealing the implications of gender in keeping crafts separate from the fine arts. So I think that talks about why this is so incredibly important. So um, just for a kind of entry point, I think you touched on this, but what drew you to this topic? Did you know you wanted to write a print-based dissertation and later book, or you talked about it with Joanne Moser, but what really attracted you to this? Um, yeah, good question. So uh, as I said, I, I, I knew that when I went to graduate school, I wanted to write about prints and I knew I wanted to write about women artists, but I had no idea what that would end up looking like. Um, and I think it was just sort of this connection uh, to Louise Nevelson that hooked me. Um, and I am very thankful to my advisor for recommending the topic and um, for connecting me with a few Nevelson scholars, including um, Nevelson's granddaughter who made a few introductions for me. Um, but it was getting to read the material that um, Lori Wilson, who's a Nevelson biographer, um, pulled together in the 70s when she was at uh, CUNY doing her dissertation on Nevelson that um, intrigued me because she had interviews with Ward and Day and with Minna Citron uh, and Jan Gelb and they're all talking about how Nevelson um, flouted these rules and um, that there was something somehow wrong with what she was doing there and yet I kept looking at these prints and thinking okay well technically she didn't make the best print here but it's so expressive and it's so interesting and so then as I you know, began to open up my inquiry into what else was done at Atelier 17, I began to see that there were a lot of, of women there and a lot of possibilities and a lot of avenues. So um, that was that was kind of how it all started. I guess, uh, wonderful. I guess another question would be about Hater's studio, both in New York and Paris, how it may have been different. I think you talked about it with the new school, but with his attitude towards women artists, was it the same in the first iteration in, in Paris or do you, did you find that was saying that responded that was more prevalent in New York with women students? Jennifer? Yes. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. You just spoke <laughs> for a minute. 
Um, I think the question was how New York and Paris were different. Yeah, within Hater Studio, how would the atmosphere for women artists be, um, women students in both New York and the first uh, Paris? Right, so that was a, something that I mulled around a lot. Um, and um, it was harder to get a handle on what was going on in Paris. Um, because it just, Atelier 17 didn't have this reputation that it had once it got to New York and then when it went back to Paris in the post-war period. Um, there are a few people who studied there who talked about it. Um, and the one who I think gave me the clearest idea was, was Dorothy Daner, who was there in Paris with her husband, um, but didn't feel comfortable studying at the Paris Atelier because as she said, she didn't think she had proven herself as an artist. And yet David Smith went, you know, and worked there for at least several, you know, weeks making a group of prints. Um, I think that Dana felt this intimidation that there were a lot of very well-known um, artists. She says it was Picasso and Brock. No, Picasso was there for technical advice. I don't think he ever once the studio came to New York and it was aligned with the new school, um, there was a real model of equality and, um, and that the new school said very clearly that anyone could be admitted to any of its courses. And it wasn't um, a degree granting institution at that time. It was um, aimed to get people in to hear lectures and to, um, to you know, broaden their um, their education after their, you know, nine to five job. Mm. So um, it was this moment, I think, when Natalia 17 was already open. I mean, there were many women who studied in Paris, but it wasn't until it came to New York that um, it really solidified this um, equal playing field. Um, and I talk about this in the book a lot also, that um, as Hayter developed his way of sort of running the workshop, because he never really liked to be a teacher. He never thought of himself as a teacher. Um, it was about giving people the tools and the knowledge to do the work that they would do in the studio and to make sure that every member knew how to do everything mm -hmm. from carving a plate to printing it and inking it um, and also just how to market oneself. And so if you gave everybody those tools, then um, they could go on and really do the work themselves. So this um, core competency that he gave all members, I think also gave, um, provided a lot of equal foundations for men, women, people who came from other, you know, there's so many emigres who came to Atelier 17 after, after the war in New York. It was, it was very much a catch all for, uh, for people who had been displaced because of World War II. Now, this proficiency that you talked about that he demanded that was required for every student, I wonder if you could unpack that a little bit about exactly what it meant, because these women are also working in intaglio, which is a very physical um, process, especially with the, the engraving. So I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that and the skills that they would have acquired and, and what impact that would have on their career. Sure. So. Um... It was uh, hard and I think many people, um, men and women, uh, didn't necessarily find a home in engraving. Haters, you know, main uh, love. Um, and you hear artists who, who sort of said, um, I don't want to, I don't want to make engravings. And so they would go on and experiment and find other things that they, they um, enjoyed instead, like soft round etching, or um, many people would make unique monoprints. Uh, at the studio, um, but it was grounded, I think, and I would love to be able to explore this more. I think it all was grounded in Joseph Pinnell because his student, uh, Mary Huntoon, who goes on to teach Hayter, um, was self-sufficient herself. And she taught Hayter how to do everything from soup to nuts. Um, and this really disrupted a model of printmaking in interwar Paris, where um, typically if you made a print, I mean, now there were some exceptions to this of artists who had their own presses and who were working on independently in their own studios, but this disrupted a model of the master printer um, who was responsible for printing your plate once you 
you know, had it done. Um, and most of the master printers in Paris were men. Um, and so all of a sudden you have other artists who are able to print and ink their plates and make their own artistic effects. Mm -hmm. um, now, again, going back, you have people like Degas and Pizarro and Cassatt who were kind of experimenting on their own, um, but this was by far not typical. Um, and women worked the press too. You had this very physical. Yeah, maybe we'll go back to an image um, as we're chatting. Um, yeah, and Christine, I had a question uh, along those lines. Uh, we had a question from Jan Johnson who uh, is wondering, and um, since uh, Hayter was so successful in attracting so many women to his studio, would you say that based on your research, um, he had an egalitarian attitude himself? Right, so that's another question that people ask a lot because there are these two really famous stories that keep getting circulated in Atelier 17 lore about how Nevelson, or well, a couple of them, there's more than two. Nevelson said, oh, Hayter hovered too close to me and I didn't like that. And so people have read that as evidence of his anti-woman stance or Louise Bourgeois for whom, you know, this sort of memory of trauma was very important to her persona. Um, in her later career, talked about hate, how haters screamed at her, and this traumatic event really s cemented in her mind that he was um, not uh, not supportive of women. And I think that as I got to know, particularly after I finished the book and I started to do all this biographical research on the hundred women, I began to see that in fact, Hayter was incredibly supportive of women. Um, and if, if you were curious and if you wanted to do the work and kind of forward his model of, of investigation into um, printmaking in, in different directions, then he really supported you. And you would be, you know, one of his best students, you know, that, or that, he would maintain these relationships with artists for decades. And um, many women after they had, let's say left the art world for 20 years during which they were having children and raising them and, you know, and had to put their careers on hold, then they would go back to Paris in the seventies and the eighties and visit with Hayter and his wife and, and really, um, you know, it was almost like the relationship never ended. So, um, I would say it was not what I expected when I started. We had a, another question um, from Catherine Sullivan, uh, wondering if these women had an impact on academic printmaking as teachers later on. So that's an avenue that um, I talk about in my book's conclusion. And um, many women were unable to get those full-time tenured positions at the university level but it doesn't mean that they didn't have impacts um, in different ways. And many of these artists did go on and teach on the high school and um, secondary school side. And, um, and so I think that's an important thing to capture, um, though it's harder to capture than let's say a university professor. Um, but there were a couple of women who did go on and start their own studios like Ruth Leaf. Um, and Ruth had a studio out in Queens. And so they were these networks that were maybe outside of the traditional university model that are important to, to factor in. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about the networking and how women operated, not just making their art at Atelier 17, but you talk a lot about networks and you even talk about how Hayter was a consummate you know, networker and maybe if you could speak a little bit about the impact that that would have on these artists' career, but also on future generations who may perhaps not even have been aware of the Atelier 17 women. Sure, so um, they did, uh, as I read correspondence, they did write to one another and they did share news of, I got this fellowship and I um, got my work into this collection and I showed at this annual, there were so many print annuals after 1947 when the Brooklyn Museum um, started its major um, print annual that happened every year until the, the 60s and then it went to biennial. But anyway, um, women would talk and these, these opportunities would be posted on the bulletin board at Atelier 17 to submit your work to um, you know, the Texas printmakers 
et cetera, et cetera. So um, these opportunities were out there, but women were definitely encouraging each other privately. And another one of my sort of favorite stories is how Nevelson and Daner were very good friends um, and maintained a friendship. And Nevelson achieved a lot more um, attention than Daner ever did for her sculpture. But um, Nevelson was at Tamarind in the 70s and then told June Wayne, who was Tamarind's founder, that she should invite Daner to come out and make prints. And so it's that kind of support for one another that gave women more opportunities. And I talk in the book a, a lot about how um, this kind of networking was much more possible for women in the field of printmaking than it was in say painting or sculpture, where the avenues for showing one's prints or sculptures was much more limited. Um, group shows had a much lower bar to entry, um, even though it still was very difficult to get your work into one of these print annuals or a group show at a gallery but um, they were much more open to women than, than those other um, media, which are considered higher you know, in the mid-century art world uh, on, the, on the hierarchies than, than printmaking was. Can you talk a little bit about, you used, uh, you wrote a, a bit about the kitchen and, and the impact of the kitchen and with some of the inventions and some of the artists, could you say a few words about, about that, how that some technical developments and also, um, how it might relate to the prints they made. Right, so I talk a little bit about the space of the studio and if you are um, able to see the slide still, um, on the lower right is uh, Ruth Cyril um, working at what was a sort of makeshift hot plate in uh, the studio on 8th Street. Um, and she's working on this Victorian uh, era um, stove and which of course was just whatever they could get that would heat a, a plate. But it's so interesting that it's covered in ink. She's covered in ink, um, she's, but she's still working on this kitchen tool. And, and so uh, there are so many different synergies between the kitchen and printmaking um, that women sort of exploited as a way to maybe make their work as printmakers more acceptable to the period's gender norms. Um, but yet allow them to make these really important breakthroughs. And so I talk at length about um, Sue Fuller's exploration of, um, of sugar lift aquatin um, and finding a new method for putting um, that mark with sugar lift on her plate using caro corn syrup, this sort of standard um, post-war uh, bottle of caro that many people had in their kitchen pantries um, and now is a sort of standard item that we see in print studios is the caro corn syrup um, but not many people know that it was because of sue fuller that you have this um, and she kind of created a whole bunch of different um, techniques like this sort of experimentation in her own home kitchen um, but le led to breakthroughs that we may take for granted at this point and that was in one of Hader's um, books, was it? Was it not? But she wasn't credited. Is that correct? Or one of the first counts of the sugar lift? Christina, I lost you for a minute. Jennifer. Oh, okay. I was just wondering also to follow up on that with um, with uh, how that was presented. Uh, Hader writes about her discovery, does he not, in one of his books? But yeah, um, he fully. <laughs> right. He he. Um, you know, she always felt that he didn't want to be beholden uh, to a woman and particularly, um, she said, an American woman. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that that he undercut her her discovery that he had said, oh, well, we were doing um, sugar lift aquatin all the time in Paris. Mm -hmm. um, and yet it was through a lot of hard work that she dug into one of her printmaking books, um, Lumsden's The Art of Etching, and like reverse engineered how to do this. Um, and so rather than say like, she's made this great contribution, he had to say, well, we were doing it already. Um, and again, people look at that and they say, well, he wasn't supportive of women, but um, you know, at the same time, there's another example in the book where he talks about her, um, her work with string and says, this is really remarkable. So, you know, it's a bit of both. <laughs> And you do juxtapose his uh, studio with those of uh, 
other artists who were working even directly across the street and how, and I think you did a good, a good job about that. Right. Um, I was wondering if also maybe you could say something about the impact that these artists would have on, um, you show the Miriam Shapiro, but of artists maybe who don't know their inventiveness, but the, um, what impact these artists may have had on later generations of artists. And then a second question is that although some artists are now um, considered feminists, they rejected that label at the right. time. And maybe if you could speak a little bit about that. Right. So um, I would say that many, to answer the first question, um, many of these women, um, I think, particularly bourgeois, were upheld by later um, artists as feminist art icons. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that they were examples of women who had persevered and made um, these great breakthroughs at a time when the art world was more hostile um, to women. Um, and I think that um, some of the models that these women in the 50s uh, were, were putting together of um, collective you know, action and collegiality and communal support were really important to some of the artist run galleries that you see started in the 70s, like um, particularly the women's only galleries like ARS, ARS Artemisia, Women's Space, um, uh, and no, it's not ARS, it's AR, ARC, I think. Anyway, um, and then to answer your second question, yes, there were many women who rejected this label of being a, a feminism. Um, and the two who had the really most ambivalent relationships, I think, were Bourgeois and, um, and Nevelson, who um, you know, are the two most people know uh, when, they, when you mentioned Atelier 17 in this time period. Um, but even someone like Sue Fuller, and we can go to her slides in just a minute. Um, she is here. Go to see Sue. Um, she was really uh, unsure about how to relate to feminism as it developed in the 70s. Um, she like admired the Guerrilla Girls and their activism, let's say outside of the Whitney Museum in the 70s, uh, outside the biennial that, um, calling attention to women not being included in the biennial, but um, she wanted to sort of make sure that the Guerrilla Girls knew and, and the activists knew how hard it was to be one of these token women artists and how hard she worked to get her work into um, the Whitney Museum's collection. And she did manage to get um, some of her string uh, wrapped pieces into the Whitney and into the Metropolitan Museum. But this was, you know, for her, quite, quite a challenge. Um, so. Again, they had this many had this ambivalent uh, relationship with feminism, and while they may not have been um, self-professed feminists, I think that it's important to see some of the activities that they did um, underline some of the feminist activity that you see later, and the strategies that they might have had. Christina, we had a, a question about the business model of the studio. I'm wondering if the artists uh, paid fees to work at Atelier 17 and also if they uh, made money from the sale of the prints. So Jenny, you cut out for a second. Um, so did they pay fees? They did not. They paid, um, well, when it was at uh, the new school, they paid tuition to the new school. And then when it was independent, um, they did pay by the week um, or by the month, um, sometimes by the semester. But this was all part of a collective effort to maintain the studio. Um, the studio never really had an income stream beyond um, student contributions or, or member contributions. Uh, so it wasn't like if you sold a print at one of the um, at one of the group shows that Atelier 17 had, that money went to the artist as opposed to to Atelier 17. Um, and so this is something that was always a problem in New York was paying the rent, and that's part of the reason that the studio ultimately folded in New York was it just did not have enough money to keep the lights on. Great, thank you. Um, we had a question from uh, Shelley Langdale wondering if um, the fact that these women had worked for Hader um, helped them in securing academic 
academic um, teaching positions, if the, the men who are hiring faculty perhaps gave them greater consideration because they had worked with Hayter? Well, as I mentioned earlier, not many women went on to teach in university settings. I mean, I can name on my fingers a few who had um, sort of part-time adjunct, what, I, what we would consider to be adjunct positions at this point. Um, and I suppose, I don't think I've ever really read um, a letter of introduction from Hayter to, to any university search committee. So I'm not sure I could say specifically that that helped. But certainly having worked at Atelier 17 was something that you would stamp quite prominently on your CV if you were applying for a job or trying to get your work into a museum collection. It was a badge of honor, you know, that you had worked here and that you were somehow very qualified to be making prints. Um, I think that's probably a good place for us to wrap up. We're just a few minutes after the hour, um, unless Jennifer has anything else to, to ask. I think um, the only thing I would say is that I know you've curated an exhibition on this in the book. How would you say maybe they function in relation to each other? What were you able to do in an exhibition versus the book and, and vice versa? Well, as with everything, I think in this virtual world that we're living in now. Um, yeah, the third, the third option. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to, have, to be able to put things um, next to one another. And so the opportunity to have, um, wow, the show was at Pollock Krasner House and then went on to the Zimmerly Art Museum at Rutgers um, where I had finished my degree. And it was just an opportunity to put sculpture in person next to a print, next to a, you know maybe one of Anne Ryan's collages and really see that relationship between the materials and how important materials were to what came out of Atelier 17 for so many women, that it wasn't just about this end product of making prints, but it was about this generative force behind um, the way that one operated at Atelier 17 that created so many avenues for women's creative work after their membership there. Well, wonderful. I, I know uh, we're deeply appreciative of the work that you've done, which is just absolutely fantastic. And the research you did on the works at the Met is, is really, um, it's just really amazing. And we're very grateful for this. So thank you and congratulations. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you.